Hey, what's up? I got some more lore content for you guys. The new expansion is coming out soon, which means the ranked season is about to reset. So if you want to get your last minute climbing in, now is the time. Along with my other meta reports over the past three weeks, I believe I have covered tons of master tier level decks, so definitely check them out if you haven't. In this video, I want to cover three underrated climbing decks. These decks are extremely powerful, but are seeing much less play than the more popular decks. So if you're bored of playing the top five most popular strategies, but still want something powerful, then this video is for you. Let's see what these rogue decks are, shall we? Welcome to Meta Report. And starting us off, we have a cult classic in the form of Lurk. With a win rate of 52.18% and a play rate of 1.61%, it is definitely being slept on. Now its best matchups are against Rise, so if you want to trounce Rise, definitely play some Lurk, Cultus, Lee Sin Akshon, and Nasus Kindred. Now the worst matchups are Caitlyn Nora, Pirate Aggro, Ezreal Anti Control, and also Plunder. Getting into the list specifically, this is my specific version. It's only a little bit different than what most people play because the deck building for Lurk is pretty straightforward. I also have a lot of experience with the deck, so hopefully you guys enjoy my list. Getting into the numbers specifically, we start with Bloodbait, which is one mana Lurk spell. Create a Snapjaw Swarm on top of your deck. So this is really cool because Lurk as a keyword works like this. When you attack with anything, as long as you have a Lurker ally on top of the deck, all Lurk allies everywhere will get plus one attack. And this of course scales throughout the course of the game. So you'll get some like uh, one twos that scale up into like seven attacks. So you can just like drop a one mana seven two in the mid and late game and pressure that way. It's a really uh, attack focused deck that has a lot of attack pressure. So the reason we want to put Snapshot Swarm in the deck is not only is it a Lurker, so we get a guaranteed Lurk proc, but also we can play Snapshot Swarm on our defense turn to start a free attack and proc Lurk you know, on defense turn, which is nice because that way we get to turbo the attack procs, which has synergy with the deck, which has synergy with our main win con. So yeah, overall, just a really good card. I like to have it in as a quick two of because it is a lurker spell that is fantastic for us and for our consistency. Next, we have Forsaken Bakai. I run this at a quick two of because I don't want to run, you know, too many non lurkers. Honestly, this deck is meant to be turbo consistent. It only runs four non lurk cards. And if you see them in your opening hand, you automatically keep them. So that means that over the course of the game, we'll, we will be proccing lurk quite often and quite consistently. So Forsaken Bakai comes down on turn one. Play, predict. If you pick a Darkener Equipment, grab me one. That's never going to happen because we don't run any of those. We just use it as a quick predict card. That way we can hit Rek'Sai, we can hit Pike, we can Curve if we want to hit something else, right? And this is just really nice. Predict has insane synergy with Lurk because you can manipulate what is actually being Lurked on the top of your deck. Next, we have some more one drops in the form of Sharkling, which is just a Lurk card, pretty vanilla. We also have Hatchling, which is a fearsome Lurker, really nice because early game units have a hard time blocking it, so you get some cheap damage in uh, in the early game. Next, we have another Predict card. Again, same reason as Bakai. We love predicting because we want to hit Rek'Sai, Pike, and then other stuff like that. So he's really nice to have it a quick two of as well. Next, we have Call the Pack. To play, put a card from hand on top of your deck, create two random lurkers. Now this can kind of unbrick your hand because in this deck you actually want champions to remain in your deck and you want to predict them and you want to hit them on top. So Call the Pack allows us to uh, fix our hands. Like let's say we have multiple Rek'Sai's or we have Pike in hand. We can do Call the Pack, put that Pike or Rek'Sai right on top of the deck, get some free units out of it, play those, attack, and then we get the Lurk effect that we want, right? From the Pike or the Rek'Sai. So it's a really nice little consistency tool that I enjoy. It is also a Lurker spell. So if it's on top of the deck, it will proc Lurk and that is just super good. It's a very nice consistency card. Next, we have Triple Redfin Hammersnout, one of the cards that actually makes this deck extremely powerful. Play Grant an Enemy Vulnerable. So on play Vulnerable is just honestly really good. Be able to uh, target something that your opponent really doesn't want you to remove. Pesky Champions. You can trade like even your 1 and 2 drops into like a 4 or 5 cost champion just because you're going to be ramping in stats over the course of the game. So yeah, that's really nice being able to just target and trade really high up into things. Next we have Hard Run Snapjaw Swarm. We want this, of course, to uh, start a free attack on our defense turn. That way we turbo lurk. Love that. Rek'Sai, one of our champions. When I lurk or attack, grant lurker allies everywhere. So if Rek'Sai is on top of the deck and you attack, you get plus two instead of plus one. Really nice to double up on the attack stack. And then also whenever she attacks, uh, it also is an AoE plus one for everything. So really nice overall. Round end, place me into your deck. 
So that's really bad. We don't want to play Rek'Sai early because round end should just going to go away unless we literally need to turbo for some reason. Like it doesn't come up too often, but we want to keep Rek'Sai in hand and in deck until she's leveled because when she levels, she loses the ability to go back into the deck and gets to stay on board with a really big attack stack and also overwhelm and also on level create three random lurkers in hand. So if you dump your hand uh, in the early mid game and you have nothing else, if you're able to level Rek'Sai, you get some resources back. Those can be one drop they can be like three drops they can even be some top end cards for you because they are random and there are a lot of lurk cards at different uh cost ranges so that's really nice Rek'Sai is one of our finishers being a big overwhelm unit next we have Xerxai Caller play predict so just like our predict cards that we're running this one is also a lurker so it's like the best one and it's also a 3-2-3 um really good card obviously we want to predict Rek'Sai or Pike ideally so very nice Pike, our other champion. When I lurk, transform me into death from below. So this is the most powerful part of the deck in my opinion. We want to put Pike on top in some way, either predict or put him there with call the pack, and then lurk him so he becomes Pike spell. Summon Pike, striking an enemy. It's a four cost fast speed spell, so it's really nice to do on the opponent open attack. Uh, you can also just lead with it, and then you have uh, a lurk Pike that's also attacking, really scary. So yeah, he will like strike the enemy so this is really important to getting lurk up early if you can get him to like four or five attack then he strikes for four or five attack which is absolutely fantastic on a summon and then if he does enough damage over the course of the game he will level and whenever he kills an enemy he strikes the weakest one and then if he kills that one he'll strike the next weakest one and then if he kills that one he'll strike the next weakest one yes they brought pike's chain killing ultimate from league straight into legends or in terra and it's absolutely amazing looking if you resolve it, you automatically win the game. More often than not, the opponent will surrender before you get to see it. But if you do see it, it is a spectacle to witness. It is so sick. Next, we have Blood in the Water, which is a Lurker spell that also uh, allows you to rally. So deal one to anything. This can be Nexus. This can be hitting a 1 HP unit that you don't want to block. You also rally. So it's nice. You can attack again on your attack turn uh, to close out the game. Or you can attack on defense turn to put out some pressure. And then set up for a next open win. So that's really nice. Next, we have a 5 cost Lurker. Attack, if you have 8 plus power, give me Fearsome, Overwhelm, Spell Shield. Just a pseudo finisher, nice mid game card. Xerxai Doombreaker, an Overwhelm Lurker. Another nice mid to late game finisher. And then, of course, to round out the list, 2 Jawfish. 8 mana, 2 7, but of course, you know, once you're lurking, he's going to be like a 5 7, 6 7, 7 7. Uh, each Lurker ally strikes a random enemy. Now, the effect is purely random, but if you have, like, four Lurkers and the opponent has, like, two cards and you really want to kill them, Jawfish is probably going to hit, um, unless they all hit four on, like, one unit. That would be absolutely tragic, but more often than not, he will come down and strike something that you definitely want to kill. Uh, since your Lurkers are going to be very high attack and they're striking, they're definitely going to kill most of the time, so just a really nice little top-end card to close out some really pesky games that go into the late game. And that's it for the deck rundown. Now here's a live commentary game so you can see how it plays out. I'll be giving context while I'm playing certain cards and hopefully it gives you a good feel on how to play the deck. All right, for the example game, we have Ash LeBanc. Uh, one of my go-tos as well, really cool, really fun deck. So we're going to pitch Call the Pack. Normally I would keep Call the Pack if I see a champion in hand, that way we have the synergy and like the combo potential right away. But since we don't see champion, it's kind of a dead card so we'll get rid of it and then keep our early game. Forsaken Bakai on attack 1 is super nice. Honestly, in general, Lurk wants to attack on odds because you get to attack and start procking Lurk right on turn 1, right? So that is ideal for us. We're going to want to do that. We want to hit Rek'Sai here. That way we start turboing our Lurk stacks and we're going to be chilling. Boom. Now Lurk is up plus 2 already on turn 1, so we are already turboed. Very nice. And we have called the pack in hand as well for the Rek'Sai. We mulligan back into it, so that's nice. Also, a little side note of something that happened. Uh, Forsaken Bakai is not a Lurker, but we still Lurked. Why did that happen? Well, that's because the only thing that matters is if you have a Lurker on top of the deck. You can attack with any kind of ally as long as a Lurker is on top. You will get the Lurk proc. Yep, go ahead and swing into my Hatchling. Looks good. Riddle Steel, nice little combo for you. That's fine. Get a little bonk. I will probably grab that with Hammer Snout just to pressure it, get it out of here. If they play LeBonk, uh, they can't block with her anyways. I'm also going to do Call the Pack Rek'Sai to keep our Lurk turboing. Okay, Calling Strike, that's fine. Commit to the game plan. Call the Pack Rek'Sai. 
go ahead and do that. See, our units are very big already. This is a 1 mana 5-1. A 3 mana 6-3. Incredibly aggressively statted. Our 6 mana unit has 7 attack already with Overwhelm, so very scary indeed. LeBonk. That's fine. We can just play Caller. See what's going to be on top of the deck. Um, I'm down to have Jawfish in hand or play Chronomancer. Next turn. Sounds pretty good in general. Then we can play Hatchling. Get that down. Alright, here we go. Let us lead the turn with Chronomancer. We see Pike. Perfect. With the power of time, the possibilities are endless. If we play Rek'Sai, Rek'Sai is going to go up to 8 and then 9 because we're lurking. So not enough to level yet. We want to get her to 10. So we're just going to swing now. And then chill with Pike spell in hand. You also know if you lurk Pike because it shows his face in your deck. The opponent doesn't see that, by the way. The opponent sees Rek'Sai, but the opponent does not see if you lurked Pike. So that's another really important thing to keep in mind. Oh wow, just massive Frostbite turn. I feel like that's completely fine for us. So we're going to go ahead and ship it out. And pick up our Pike spell. Uh, if they play Ash, we probably kill Ash, right? Oh, interesting. LeBonk. Um, I say we just death from below LeBonk. We could also put up a blocker in case something weird happens. It. it plays into Whirling Death, which is a card they don't often play. They could play... Um, a bunch of other stuff though, but I don't think we have to worry about Whirling, so we're going to put this up into combat in case she does live through buffs somehow, and then uh, I, I will take much less damage by just committing a block target. Go. Very nice. I would like a Snapjaw Swarm on top of the deck. Can you hear them? That way we can attack twice next turn with the, uh, the Swarm. It's just a little bit extra damage with what I'm doing. Revna is fine. Alright, so Rek'Sai on summon is probably going to get Frostbitten. So I think leading with the Snapdraw Swarm is also just fine. Then it forces them to play something and then maybe they won't be able to Frostbite our Rek'Sai and we'll be in a good spot. We're also just killing the unit. Bonk. Okay, your turn to play. It's just a little bit safer for our Rek'Sai, you know? Hopefully no Harsh Winds or Flash Freeze right on the summon. It would be a... <laughs> Pike's voice line's nice. Um, it would be a little unfortunate if they do Frostbite her, because we want her to finish the game. Okay. Swing with Pike first is usually a good habit to get into, because he can chain kill in certain scenarios. So attack with Pike first. Rek'Sai Overwhelm over here. Nice! Look at this. Love that. We're just pushing a lot of damage, and we also have not uh, another Snapjaw Swarm for follow-up. Very cool. Yep, living with one. Still living with one, and you kill my unit. That's pretty good. You're also killing my Rek'Sai, which is not nice. And a Culling Strike. Sheesh! But... You are at 3 HP, and I have a free attack. Sorry to say, but Rek'Sai created this card. Ah, boom. Now the next deck I have for you has been pretty popular recently, but also completely off the radar for a few weeks, and that is Jax Orn. With a win rate of 54.97% and a play rate of 1.34%, it's a very spooky deck actually. Its best matchups include a Rumble Vein combo, Cultus, Evelyn Kaisa, and also Seraphine decks. Now the worst matchups are Rise, Heimer Nora, Jin Annie, and also Pirates. So it seems to be kind of weak into the hard control and also the hard aggro, but anything in the mid range, it tends to beat. Getting into the list specifically, we start with a couple three sisters. Three sisters can be flexible freeze, buff, or also single target removal for a couple turns. So pretty nice just to have the flexibility. We are a mid range deck. We want to have the different options. 
all of these can potentially come up depending on the matchup and depending on what the opponent is playing. So really nice to just have it at a quick two of. I don't like to run it at three because it can get quite bricky since it is a big mana investment, especially to play some of the, like, you know, the two higher cost ones. So I like to run it at a quick two of. It's just nice to have. Next, we have Weaponsmith Apprentice recently buffed card and has been the reason for this deck's success in my opinion. The first time you equip an ally, so anytime a, a unit is equipped with a weapon, whether it be a weapon master or if you just hard equip from hand, forge it. Forge it means grant the weapon plus one plus one. So that is really nice. You get to have just a premium weapon. Uh, as long as you play this card first and then the equipment, you will get plus one plus one permanently on that weapon. Very, very scary. It's a one mana one two, so it can block uh, enemy one drops that are like two ones and trade even so that's really nice against aggro and also has a very strong combo playing this card into Jax. if you play weaponsmith apprentice on defense one into Jax on attack two Jax will be a two mana four three with quick attack which is already really hard to deal with for the opponent so very scary power curve if you can open both of them next we have entrancing lure give an ally challenger this round if it's equipped draw one for two mana that's crazy that is very high value give an ally challenger so oftentimes jacks or something that's equipped uh, because you want to draw one then you can you know use the challenger to take out a priority target things your opponent doesn't want you to remove uh important champions things like annie uh things like ezreal things like seraphine you can just beat them down right so really nice to have the challenger plus the draw cycles itself really really good value next we have favored artisan i call this card grandma so grandma is a two two three when i'm summoned create a time and dedication which is a one mana focus speed spell forge an ally so it's the same effect as the apprentice grant a ally one one if the ally is equipped grants to the weapon instead sometimes this can come up as a quick focus speed one one buff on a unit but oftentimes you're just going to hit a weapon with this and give the weapon one one so really nice premium uh defensive stats two two three really good uh can block like three twos can block uh, two ones and still live, two twos and still live, so really nice card. Next we have Fish Fight, this is a strike spell. An ally and an enemy strike each other, or, so you get to choose, an equipped ally strikes an enemy and then is unequipped. So if you don't want to take damage back on your unit, you can just strike them and then re-equip your unit, so that's really nice. It's uh, not super mana efficient because it costs four to like re-equip your weapon, but like the strike is so good, it's like concerted, but one less mana and one less target, but like it's good enough, so it's a good card, uh, basically is what it boils down to. Fish Fight, really nice. Uh, it is slow speed, so keep that in mind, but very, very strong uh, strike spell. Next we have Ionian Hookmaster. When I'm summoned, I improvise. So the way improvise works, which is the main mechanic this deck is going to be playing around, choose one of two random options from a depleting pool of equipment and equip it to this ally. If the ally wasn't played from hand, it equips a random equipment. Okay, so what this means is there are eight weapons in existence currently that we can pick from. It shows us two. You pick one. You can't pick it again until all the cards have been picked uh, over the course of the game. You can also look at the weapons specifically if you go into the filter and then hit improvise weaponry. We can see all of them. This is all eight. This one is a plus two plus one. So these stats are granted to your ally that you have equipped. Attack, refill a mana, two zero overwhelm, two zero tough, one two uh, impact, two one fearsome, three two can't block, two zero quick attack, and one zero scout. Now the main weapons that you are going to want in this deck are scout and overwhelm because those are the highest value. Uh, tough is really good in certain matchups. Quick attack is obviously very good. Fearsome's fine, the Pot of Pain is really good if you want a tanky unit, but yeah. Uh, Scout and Overwhelm weapons are great because you get to bump them up with Forge over the course of the game, and then they're absolutely insane. You can put them on Orn later, and then they're just like, just the best ones, you know, for Orn, and that's our win con, so really nice. Try to pick those. Next we have Jax, our first champion. Um, on summon, he auto-equips the Light of Icathia, which is a weapon. It just gives him 0-0, and also Overwhelm. And he's also, he has Overwhelm as well. So the weapon is Overwhelm. He has Overwhelm. That's cool. Um, if equipped allies strike over the course of the game for 12 damage, he levels and then he gets plus one, plus one for each equipped ally that you have on his attack call. So he gets a really big, really scary. He's just going to be a big Overwhelm beat stick, right? Pretty simple game plan. Uh, his champion spell, give Jax barrier and forge him. The forge is really nice. Barrier is really nice for damage removal or for trades, and he's pretty scary. So yeah, we're going to be playing him in the early game for pressure. Next, we have triple troll chant because we are in Freljord and we are combat focused. So troll chant is just the best option for us. Next, we have Piltoven Castaway. When I'm summoned, I improvise, and also he comes with a tune. So refill spell mana. That way we can play our spells and also play him and get a weapon. Nice. 
Wandering Shepherd can put a weapon on himself or also put a weapon on someone else. So something I like to do is play Grandma on too and then give her the weapon because she has better stats than he does. So yeah, he can give other things weapons. So oftentimes things that are better statted than he is. Very nice. Uh, Babbling Bjerg, when I'm summoned, draw a unit with 5 plus power. We only run one of those and that is Orn. So this is our Orn tutor. That way we can curve into him in the mid late game for consistency. Combat Cook, when I'm summoned, I improvise and also forge me. So he comes with a weapon and a free plus one plus one for that weapon. Really nice, really scary. Um, Parts Made Whole, this is an optional card. Two play, discard one, draw two, and if you discard an equipment, summon uh, Icathian Mirage. I really like this card because it's premium draw. You only discard one and you draw two. If you discard an extra weapon, like one you don't need, because oftentimes you'll have like one or two extra weapons in hand, you can discard it and get a free body. And also draw two, which is really nice when you're trying to find your mid-game win cons and like trying to get to your Orn, uh, get to your Babbling Beard, which gets to your Orn. Just a really nice card, and it's also a burst speed blocker in case you're fighting aggro. So that's really cool. Next we have two Hearthblood Mender, forge an ally twice and heal it, and your Nexus three. Really nice to play against aggro to get that heal, but of course forging an ally twice is massive. This is like insane stats on your weapon. Love that. And then Orn to finish out the game, we have a 7 mana 5-5, five five. equip me with an exact copy of an ally's equipment or strongest equipment from hand, so you, he takes a copy of the strongest weapon, puts it on himself, that's really nice if we have developed scout or overwhelm, and then put that on him because those are the best keywords for Orn himself. On attack he forges himself twice, so plus 2, nice. Uh, level up an ally is struck for 8 damage at some point, then he levels, and then this is where he becomes the win con. So on attack, he, he does everything the same. On attack, he forges himself twice and then summons a Spirit of the Ram, which is an Overwhelm Ephemeral unit that will gain the stats that he has. So like, let's say Orn's a 13-13 with Overwhelm or Scout. That's really scary because you're also going to get a Spirit of the Ram with the same stats. So a 13-13 and this naturally has Overwhelm, so that's going to be our win con. And that's it for this deck rundown. Now here's a live commentary game so you can see how it plays out. And for the example game, we have the ever popular Jace Lux. Very strong deck in the meta, of course. Um, we're going to pitch Parts Made Whole for sure here and probably the Castaway as well, because I want to greedily mulligan for the Jax since we are on Weaponsmith Apprentice. Something else we could do is keep the Castaway because we play Apprentice on one, we float turn two for Troll Chant, we have Castaway for attack three with the guaranteed um, Forge, so. It's kind of fine to keep. Maybe I won't be that greedy and just keep it because this is safe. This is a nice mulligan. Ooh, and there's our Orn. Nice. Another troll chant. That's chill. Get it. Okay, so we're going to play the one mana one two. If they play something, we pass. Yeah. We do not want to kill our unit until we get the effect off. So we can float two for troll chant or we can use it now. Um, Another four chief. We'll probably end up using it this turn, honestly. So let's do that. We give this um, zero. We give this minus two. This way, this one doesn't even strike, so they don't get the spell mana from it. And we do kill this one, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Go ahead and do it like that. We take no damage on the turn. And then we're just going to play our castaway. So oftentimes, uh, we're going to mis Mystic Shotted, sure. Our first weapon is going to be the one that we try to uh, forge and work towards, right? We don't want to split a bunch of forge on different weapons. We want to get one weapon nice and developed. Uh, Jax. I don't think we can play Jax unless we have Troll Chant to protect him because they could be on second Mystic. Uh, they could be on Thermal Beam, so we're not going to play Jax yet. Let's just do the Castaway. And get the 2-1 um, Fearsome. But this looks fun too. That way we can beat over this. It can't even block us since it's not a fearsome blocker. This could bait second mystic. Okay. I'm kind of fine with this. We trade here. They don't have any spells to react. Yeah, let's just swing. If they're down to block Badger Bear, I'm also down. Because they can also play Sharp Sight and stuff like that in single combat. And I just think that's really annoying. So let's get rid of the bear. Nice and early. Uh, and then play Jax, float three, play Mender on the Jax. Well, Jace. It isn't the man of tomorrow. Hey, back to work if you don't want to be the lady of yesterday. True. Okay. We'll just take uh, quick attack Jace to face. If we had a second Jax, by the way, we would win the game off of this because we'd be able to block the Jace and then forge him up to four and then just kill the Jace on the swing. Unfortunately, we're not on second Jax, so we can't make the game winning play. So we'll just Mender instead. 
that will heal us and also make our jacks nice and big. By the forge we create and we mend. Okay. Troll Chant does not outplay Hexbliterator, but they're not on six mana, so we don't have to worry about that till next turn. So we're going to send in the Jax and also the Mender, just because we have better stats than the opponent now. We want to play this like a mid-range beatdown deck, and we want to control the board as much as possible. Um, they're going down to three mana, so I'm pretty comfortable putting the Amulet on the Mender and just popping most damage, right? Hey, figured out the clutch in that thing yet? Get on in! You can tell me. Because I don't really care what they can do for three. I'm not really that worried. So we're going to send in both of these. Um, which should also level the Jax, if I'm not mistaken. After the Jax attack, he will level off of himself. So, that's really cool. Just get more stats on the board, essentially. Make him harder to deal with. Troll Chant can outplay uh, Hexbliterator in that case. So, we love to see it. We just continue developing weapons on defense 6, and then play Orin on attack 7 and try to win like that. Bonk, bonk, Jax level. Great animation, here it is. You know what? Also for me. He's very cool. Looking like Demon Slayer with that kind of animation for real. Alright. Turn 6. Like I just mentioned, we're just going to continue developing weapons, play defensively. Uh, we could probably lead with Artisan. If Lux comes down, I'm actually super down to Entomb her. Uh, Shock Blast. That is completely fine. And not a problem whatsoever. I can just troll chance. Um. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, hmm. Then Jax dies to two. Hmm. That's probably fine. You know what would be better for my mana? Is if I do three sisters, Fury than North. But then I lose my three sisters, so that's barely worth it. Let's just do the troll chant. Like I thought. Preventing their spell mana is actually more relevant. Magically. So we can do that. Um, then we can also combat cook. Or we can favor to Artisan and float three. I'm definitely committing to Orn next turn. Three mana doesn't do a lot for me since I need four to cast this. So I'm just going to combat cook and pick um, Overwhelm weapon, right? Glad there's a chef on the team now. What's for dinner? Oh, I uh, spilled tonight's stew in our last battle. Oops. I think it, it um, tough weapon would have been better, right? Because then I could block the Jace. That's okay. Jace can stay alive. You know what we're going to do? We're going to win through Overwhelm. Okay, so how does this work? If Jax is leveled, the Light of Akithia has Overwhelm. It's also plus two plus two. This is plus three plus one. I kind of prefer the Fishawak. So, I guess picking Overwhelm was correct in the sense that we want Orn to have that. But we could have tough here and then Overwhelm here, so. It was probably tough weapon. Mayhaps it doesn't matter. We're just going to play towards our win con, which is big Overwhelm. Orn levels off of himself, so next attack will get the ramp. I mean, this is just massive. This is a big Overwhelm swing, so. Honestly? Pretty happy I picked the Fishwhack at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, and then you're dead. So I've got to come up with something else. Sharp Sight, Concerted, uh, Back to Back, Exploiterator. Yeah. Uh, wow, these are big stat sticks. 6-2 Fearsome, 5-3 Overwhelm, 10-8 Overwhelm, 10-6 Overwhelm. Pretty scary on attack 7. Orn is a very consistent finisher card, actually. Even if he doesn't level, I mean, this is just still so much pressure. Oh. Condemn from Ferris Financia, right? And <laughs> Good. Yes. got that Orn level and Bonk, still dead. Let's go, Overwhelm weapon. And the last deck I have for you is another cult classic that comes in and out of the meta, so it is important to learn it. That is Plunder with a win rate of 54.79% and a play rate of 1.28%. The numbers don't lie. This is also a very powerful deck with winning matchups into Immortal Kegs. 
Lurk, Ash LeBonk, and Jace Lux. Now the worst matchups are Ezreal Annie, Karma Master Yi, Heimerdinger Nora, and Sedge Bard. Getting into the list specifically, this deck knows what it wants to do, it does one thing, and it does it very well, and that is proccing damage on the enemy nexus each and every turn, on attack and on defense. That way we turbo plunder all the time, and we also turbo the Gangplank and Sejuani levels, which are extremely powerful by themselves, and even more powerful aka game winning when combined with each other. So to start us off, we have Triple Warning Shot, deal 1 to the enemy Nexus. This is really good on turns that you can't deal damage to the enemy Nexus, but you want to uh, get the level up points for Gangplank and Sedge. You can also use this when Sejuani is leveled for a big AoE Frostbite, which we'll talk about. Next we have Jagged Butcher, Plunder, grant me 1-1. One, one. So Plunder says, a card triggers its Plunder ability when played if you damage the Nexus that round. So if you damage the enemy Nexus by any means, through combat or through spells, and then you play a plunder card, you get the plunder effect, right? Super simple, super nice. This is a 1-2-2, two, two. sometimes a 1-mana 3-3, three, three, which is very good beyond premium stats. Arly, deal 1 to anything. If it kills it, deal 1 to the enemy nexus. Nice little card to get rid of some really pesky aggressive units, like Legion Saboteur. You know, a quick 1-mana 2-1, two, one. it's dead, and you also proc on the nexus, giving you that Gangplank and Sejuani level up point, so it's doubly necessary and doubly good. Next we have Shell Shocker, 1 mana 2 1, also a tune, so it pays for itself. We are playing units and spells quite often in this deck, so a unit that gives you a spell mana and pays for itself is just really good. This is like really, really, really good. So 1 2 1, really nice. You can use this on attack turn, you can use it to block. You don't ever feel too bad about it dying because you got the mana back, so really solid, really good card in the deck. Next we have Black Market Merchant. When you draw an enemy card, reduce its cost by 1. Well, how are we doing that? By nabbing. So if we plunder and then play Merchant, draw a non-champion card from the bottom of the enemy deck, and then also reduce its cost by 1. That way we get to play with some of the enemy cards. Of course, really funny if we get like big removal like Vengeance. Really funny if we get Feel the Rush and stuff like that. Uh, oftentimes, he's just a nice little resource tool. Uh, if you get multiple, it stacks by the way. You can get things like cheaper by 2 or 3, so really scary. Next we have Make It Rain, of course, deal 1 to 3 different things. Hits Nexus, so that's good for our level up points. Mariah Warden, go wide, really nice. Tusk Speaker, deal 1 to all Nexuses. This is really good to play on defense turns in case you don't want to do Parley or Warning Shot or anything like that, or you just don't have anything. You can use this to quickly proc um, a damage to the enemy Nexus, accelerating the game plan. Babbling Beard, when I'm summoned, draw a unit with 5 plus power. That's Gangplank or Sedge, really nice tutor. Uh, Zap Sprayfin, when I'm summoned, draw a spell that costs 3 or less. That will be Warning Shot, Parley, Make It Rain, really nice, all super good, all super useful. So, Zap is nice, also elusive, can be a blocker, can be an attacker. I have Nagakoboros, uh, Spawn 2, Draw 2, really nice draw card to refill your hand when you play out your entire hand, because sometimes that does happen in this deck. Uh, Gangplank, our first champion. If you've damaged the enemy Nexus in five different rounds, he levels. Also on summon, summon a powder keg, which makes your uh, spell deal one extra damage. This works with skills as well, including his own. So, when I'm summon or round start, summon a powder keg, attack deal one to all enemies and the enemy Nexus, just direct damage. Really nice finisher card. Uh, the kegs make it do more, so that's really nice. Next we have Spirits Unleash. Grant allies everywhere 1-1, one, one, then deal one to everything. This is nice, we want to use this as early as possible, that makes our units like beyond premium, because all of a sudden, uh, we deal 1 to all, all things, right? We deal 1 to the enemy nexus, so that's really nice for GP and Sedge. We do 1 to our own nexus, which is a little sus, but that's okay. We deal 1 to all the enemy units, so if they have a bunch of 1 HP units, we just board wipe them. And then all of a sudden, we're spawning things with plus 1, plus 1, so our Mirai Warden's at 3-2, that summons a 1 cost that also has the buff, right? So if we summon anything from anywhere, it's going to have the buffs, so we can get some pretty insane value. All of a sudden, our understated units become premium statted and really scary and really hard to deal with, uh, including our champions that have Overwhelm. So yeah, Spirits Unleashed, fantastic card. And to round it out, we have Sejuani. Uh, she has Overwhelm on play, given enemy Frostbite and Vulnerable. Really nice because we can manipulate what we want to kill and also push Overwhelm damage. If you've damaged the enemy Nexus in five different rounds, just like uh, Gangplank, she levels. Play, same thing. Now, this is the broken part of Sejuani. Each round, the first time you damage the enemy Nexus, frostbite all enemies. So, it's basically a soft lock. If Sejuani's leveled, the opponent just doesn't have any damage. They can't play the game on attack or defense. So, yeah, Sejuani is just like a hard win con. And that's it for the deck rundown. Now, here's a live commentary game so you can see how it plays out.
And for the example game, we have a Sharima deck. He is playing Mr. Sharima Azir himself, and we have a lot of direct damage, holy. Okay, so we can do like Warning Shot on one, Make It Rain on two. I don't think we need double Make It Rain. This is actually kind of a funny hand because we can outplay a lot of stuff. Since they are playing Sand Soldiers, which are 1 HP units, we outplay them. Uh, let's go ahead and Warning Shot turn one. And then we'll do Test Speaker on defense two. Dune Keeper. Uh, yeah, Tough Speaker is great because we can actually block the one two while we're dealing the one damage to the enemy Nexus, so it's fantastic. Continually working on our GP and Sejuani level ups. Another Dune Keeper, yep. Sounds good. Um, I will block one of these and then I'm taking a hefty amount of damage. Oh, come on, block this. Sure, I'm a little scared, so I'm gonna play a little passive. Take two less damage. I get to keep the unit alive. Um, that also gives us a lead. We can lead with this and push another level up point without needing to use any of our resources. So love that overwhelm guy. Get the enhanced butcher down. Uh, yeah, pass is fine. We'll probably just add Nagako Boros this turn. We need to get to our champions uh, ASAP. I should stamp you out like the insect you are. Uh, Make It Rain is fantastic here. We hit the husk, cool. I wanted to hit Dami Mami so I could finish her off with Parley. But this is kind of okay, because now like Azir can't attack. Ooh, okay. So we block this, right? Then we play Zap. Oh, come on now. Pell Cascade. Why are you running Pell Cascade in here? But I mean, I guess that's fine. Zap. Another warning shot. Damn, we are ready to go as soon as we get our champions. We are ready to go. Proc Plunder on defense turn. Yeah, GP's leveled on summon if I can get him here. I. Uh, send in both. A little damage. We can pressure both of these. Or push four. Quicksand. Turn off the... Uh, elusive. That's fine. Now I play Shell Shocker. Get our mana back. And then Parley the Dami Mami. And then we Beerg, which is great. Because that gives us a guaranteed champion. Okay. And they're on triple Dune Keeper. Wow. I think we're set, though. We've done a great job this game, manipulating our damage to the enemy Nexus, and we also have Champion, we're on double warning shot. Doesn't matter which one we pull, uh, just either of them would be great. Another Shell Shocker, we can use that as a blocker. So probably lead with that. Oh, never mind, they open attack. Um, no, are they playing? Azir's Arise. Second Azir. Okay. So I didn't open any champs, but they opened double Azir in their top 10. Fair enough. I feel pretty convinced that here I only need to block 2-1 to 2-2, two -two, and I'll take 6. We don't want to block a tentacle because we can always make it bigger with more eye. But we can never make Shell Shocker bigger, so... Bit of an optimal block there. We'll play Beerg after. Yeah, Sejuani's great. We'll Sejuani uh, the Azir, so we can try to kill it. There's our other eye. But yeah, we'll do this. We'll send Sejuani into the Azir. Do the AoE Frostbite because Overwhelm hits Nexus. Zolani. Whoa. That's fine. We can full send it though. Um, yeah. Because AoE Frostbite means that this unit doesn't even trade into us. We also have AoE Frostbite for when this thing does actually level up and empower, so we're not actually that scared of them. We're not scared at all. We have the Sejuani Lockdown, which is all we need. Bonk. Not scared whatsoever. 
I have Nagaka Boros. Third Azir, wow. Three Azir and your Zolani in top 12, that's crazy. It took me a beard to get to my Sejuani, you know? We are not the same. We here are not the same, my friend. Um, tough speaker, AoE Frostbite. Then we'll play Black Market Merchants. And Nab. What is this, Stream of Deny or something? It is Stream of Deny, wow. Um, okay. I think they do attack then. If not, we get action. Alright. Warning shot. Pop, do the most damage to that. We can also block this for fun. My last card. Not really scared of it. Black Market Merchant. What we got here? Weapon? Weapon's pretty good. Um, yeah. We just close out next turn. Very nice. Sejuani Lockdown. And that's it for these three decks. There's actually a lot of viable decks in the meta right now. Sure, there are some really, really strong ones, like the top three decks, but there seem to be a lot of counter picks that you can use in the meta to play against them and to net some wins, right? There's a lot of decks that have like 53 to 55% win rate and some even above that that aren't that popular. So feels like there's a lot of directions to go. There's a little bit of something for everyone. There's many playstyles to enjoy. So I hope you enjoyed these three rogue decks. Stay tuned for more updates. This has been Meta Report. Thank you so much for watching and have a good one. Laters!